Hi, I'm Jeff Watts and welcome to episode 89 of the Agile Pubcast. We're still in lockdown, so this is another remote episode with Paul in his house in Bradford and Avon and me in my shed in Cheltenham in the Cotswolds. And this episode, Paul and I had just finished teaching an online advanced class. And so we spent quite a bit of time talking about some of the conversations that came up during that class. Some interesting ones, really, uh, including what, how to convince people within the team about the benefits of self-organization. Quite often we spend a lot of time convincing people outside of the team why self-organizing teams is a good idea. But there's an interesting uh, angle on that conversation. Uh, and that led us to talking about talking about emotions within the team and how that's often very difficult and often doesn't happen. And on the subject of emotions, Paul and I even spend a bit of time talking about how we'd dealt with our fears as trainers and coaches over the years. And finally, some other interesting conversation we had about whether it was dangerous going out as a as a fairly novice coach or a fairly novice scrum master and practicing your coaching skills. Um, so yeah, it was quite an interesting episode all in all. We hope you find it of interest. And if you're watching on the video, so if you're one of our patrons and watching the video, then we were using a new piece of software this episode. So that's why uh, there's a slight lag between my audio and video on that side of the screen because uh, we'll be using Paul's upload and his, his speed isn't the best. Uh, and also that's, re that's why my side was slightly more pixelated as well because he was uploading my uh, my feed through his channel. We've we've learned from that and the next time we use it, it'll be a bit better, but bear with us, that's why. And if you wanted to watch some of the videos and get some of the other benefits that we have, then check out patreon.com slash the Agile Pubcast. And uh, yeah, hopefully we will be raising a glass to you. In this episode, we're going to raise a glass to our newest patron, Amy Lane, over on the west coast of America in Seattle. Cheers, Amy, for being one of our biggest supporters. We appreciate that. And for everybody else in lockdown, we hope things are starting to get a little bit easier, a little bit more normal. Uh, and yeah, hopefully uh, we'll be seeing you uh, from a pub sometime soon. Take care and stay in touch. I think we're recording. Brilliant. I think we're on. I think we're a, we're alive, alive. Oh, fantastic. Hello to you, sir. Hello, my friend. I hope I'm not too loud. It's we're using me. new equipment today or new, new, um, software, I suppose you'd call it, wouldn't you? Infrastructure maybe. Yeah. So, um, we're trying out a new record on uh, remote recording piece of software that we downloaded while wow, we're kind of using. It's called Squadcast. We're going to see how it goes. Yeah. Well done to you for setting it up so quickly. I know. It's, it's a, bit of a bit of an experiment. We'll see how it goes. What's, um, what's, the, what's the drinks tonight, chap? What, uh, we're in our, I'm, in, I'm in the bar. What can I get for you? <laughs> well, I'm on... Um, I'm on... Uh, I've gone to Beaver Town. <laughs> well, have, have you indeed? Yeah, Beaver Town. I've got a Lupuloid. I think that's how you pronounce it. Lupuloid. IPA. I don't know what Lupuloid stands for. It's 6.7%. Uh, uh, I'm going to pour it into my glass and see what it looks like. So I've got It's another one of those. I've gone for the packaging type thing, the funky. don't even uh, know what yeah. it is. You've been uh, hoodwinked by the, the uh, funky packaging. But I do. I've had a, I've had a, um, one of their other beers before, and quite liked it. So, thought I'd give this one a try. And Very good. It's nice and golden. A little bit fizzy. Six point seven percent. It's a proper proper IPA there. Yeah, you smell the hops. Mm. Slightly sharp. Not not sour sharp. Just. It's got a got a taste to it, got a little bit of a ting to it. Ting, isn't yeah. it? Um yeah, sort of well, it's a little bit apple actually. Um yeah, quite nice. Very good. What are you going for? I got uh a choice for you left uh, of my Oh, we're still on the mystery ideas. box. Lockdown ciders in the box remaining are numbers three, uh five, 
It's like the it's like the agile principles, isn't it? It's like the <laughs> right. now there's only four left. Three, five. Slowly getting less principled. Ten and eleven. Three, five, ten, and eleven. Hang on a minute, no, no, I can't count. It's been a long day. Six, so three, six, ten, eleven. And number eleven. You have chosen. Oh, that's ten. You have chosen. Golden Harvest. Golden Harvest. Rich's Rich's cider, as in a a person called Rich. Premium Somerset cider. Um, Rich's Cider Farm. Highbridge. Do you know Highbridge? Never heard of it, mate. Somerset. One of my um, friends from university comes from Highbridge, I think. What's it famous for? Um, Highbridge and Burnham. You might... um, Kind of north Somerset coast, Bristol Channel. No, not heard nope. of it. No, nope. but Richie's cider farms there. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think Breen is it Breen Leisure Park? Oh yeah, people go surfing there, don't they? Yeah, do they? I think so. I think some of my friends from school went surfing there. It's kind of a yeah north Somerset coast coastal town. Can you hear that? I can. Is that ice? I've gone for a bit of ice today because it's one of the hottest, well, the hottest day apparently since, uh, hottest, hottest day of 2020 today, isn't it? In the it UK. Is very yeah. I've put the fan on for the first day. Yeah. And is on in the shed. It's kind of a, and May is it, is it, is the, uh, what's the date today? It's the 20, 20th of May. That looks fizzy, mate, is it? It is quite, it is quite fizzy. <clears throat> It's got almost like, like kind of a lager kind of fizziness to it. Yeah, it's quite sweet. Quite sweet, but quite clean. It's quite, quite, and on a, I'm probably looking at it through kind of rose tinted glasses today, but because uh, it's a nice summer's day, I feel like a, a cold drink, so it's going down quite nicely. Apple tinted glasses. Mm. So, possibly your favourite of the selection so far, or? It's it's up there certainly. Rich's cider, I quite quite like that. It's just a simple kind of sweet cider. It says medium on here, but I'd say it was more sweet. Very nice. Well, maybe your palate's developing, my friend. I doubt it. I doubt that very much. Maybe. So, cheers. yes, cheers, and well done. We finished the course today, didn't we? We kind of yeah. celebrated. Yeah, we did. I think it went well. Yeah, it was good. Um, Small online advanced class. Good crowd. Yeah, from from a few different places. Lots of different experiences to share. Yeah. Some good discussions were had. Mm -hmm. Some skills learned, some techniques practiced. A few teething problems with kind of online... Miro, we used Miro for the first time. Didn't really do that on a on a paired course, but um, generally, people seem quite impressed with the tool as well. I think the the feedback was that people liked the online collaborative Miro tool, which which went down quite well. Yeah, yeah, it did well. Um, yeah, what 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 stood out for you? What were some of the more interesting conversations we had? Try and think back now. I think it's certainly in terms of um, quite. We talked a lot of techniques uh, today and yesterday, and it's a lot of got questions around uh, product owners. There seemed to be a lot of how do I get my product owner to do stuff. Yeah, there were a couple. Yeah, how do I get my uh, product owner to take to look after the product backlog? How do I get stakeholders to one of the questions was around how do I get stakeholders to take the scrum master role seriously Mm -hmm. that was one that stood out for me good conversation around that yeah there was um, was another one wasn't there around actually within the team itself of how how to help team members see the benefit of cross-functional teams I thought it was interesting because quite often um it's it's usually about convincing other people 
outside of the team, the benefit of, of uh, cross-functional teams. Mm. But, um, yeah, the, this idea that you'd have to focus a little bit more on things that were slightly outside of what you would normally do, your functional area of expertise, perhaps. Yeah. Um, and putting the team first rather than your own interests. That was an interesting discussion. To be now, are you feeling jaded? Um, no, I wouldn't say I'm jaded. Um, I, I've been trying to sort of challenge myself to really pay more attention to to how I feel at the end of different types of work that I do. And mm. um, we had a bit of a discussion about about me and my uh, sort of mindset, if you like, and how training isn't something that I, was, I, I feel I was born to do. Mm. Um, and I always found it very stressful running a training course. I used to lose sleep before training courses and things. Um, I'm trying to work out you know, a little bit about why that why that is. And I usually have a sort of a sort of mini euphoric feel at the end of a course. <clears throat> I was wondering whether that was more a sense of achievement or whether it was more a sense of relief that it didn't yeah. go badly. Because mm. um, I am sort of someone who would plan for the worst but hope for the best if you like. Yeah. Um, and yeah, do tend to. Yeah. Over, I, I, you, um, you are, you are a little bit different to me. I, I tend to let things probably, um, a bit more spontaneous, but you like to know the next, so we will sit and plan the next kind of module stroke sequence or session, mini session. And you're quite thorough about timings and, expectations and things like that whereas i'm a bit more loose i think i, I think maybe i've got a bit complacent mm. i don't yeah I, I, I overly worry about the um the quality of, of and you know people's perception of it and how how much yeah. value you get from it you know mm. my I used to, yeah go on my, my um my main my fear i suppose my initial when i start i think we had a question today didn't we about how did we get started with this and how did we become trainers and how did we get past our <clears throat> fears and, uh, and our, um, um, lack of experience, I suppose. It's obviously mm. some of that does come with, with time and experience, but I think certainly I used to be quite nervous about finishing early. That was always yeah. my big thing about mm. where we've kind of got, I've gone, cause I, when, when I'm uh, nervous, I tend to rush. Okay. So my tendency was to, to believe that I'm going to finish like at, at lunchtime on day what day two, mm -hmm. and yeah. everyone will have to go home early, mm -hmm. which never really happened anyway. But um, it's, I suppose it's just how what you get used to and what my, but uh, in the back of my mind, I worry that I'm perhaps not giving enough giving enough content or giving enough value. Mm. Yeah. Um. There was, I'm trying to remember what it was now, but there was some there was some questions today about you know what if oh is it about coaching? So if I'm a scrum master, I'm learning my coaching skills. Um, yeah, I, what isn't that a bit dangerous you know, to be going out there and coaching on people when you're really quite a novice, mm. um, worried about doing damage, if you like? Um, and my my response to that was, well, the fact that you're worried about doing damage it reduces the chances of you doing damage. Mm. It's the people that go into things blindly thinking that they're, they're fully qualified before they've really read a book even that um, that are more at risk of, of doing damage. So as long as Scrum Masters or anyone really is constantly reflecting and if possible, getting some reflection from some guided reflection with someone a little bit more experienced, then the chances of, of damage are, are minimal. Mm. Yeah, certainly... Um Certainly, something I've got, got, and had to get get used to. Yeah, I can, I can still remember, still remember the you know the, the sweating and the, the the mumbling and and the pacing was all your oh, thing. Heart you used to, racing. You used to pace a lot. You used to walk up and down the room like <clears> a panther <throat> in terms mm. of side to side. 
And I think you, well, you were fully aware that you were doing it, but you didn't have a lot of control over it at the time. Mm. But now you've felt, done that. Yeah. I felt that was a coping mechanism for, so one of my worries is that, so I'm not a big talker. I'd much mm. prefer to listen than talk. Um, and I'm not, not great at making small talk, you know, in a train or something, just wouldn't talk to people. Um, so my worry was that I'd run out of things to say. Um, yeah. But I found that if I was walking, I had a sort of rhythm and I found it easier for my words to flow. Mm. And then it became a habit, mm. a habit that I, especially if you've got creaky floorboards, and I've had that a few times, creaky floorboards or a creaky stage that you're on, uh, it's quite off-putting for people. So I made a conscious effort then of, of working out how to stay more still. Because mm. uh, the attention shouldn't really be on me and where I'm moving, but rather what we're talking about. Yeah. And I've, I've probably got a bit lazy these days, a bit more hands in pockets type, leaning on flip charts and things like that. I do, I'm a bit... Um, I've just got into bad habits, I think. Well... I mean, there's an element of informality around that, isn't there? And uh, you can relax people by being informal and comfortable and relaxed yourself. Yeah, as long as you're you're not slacking off, which I don't think you do, then um, that sense of kicking off your shoes, maybe, and quite literally in your case. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I hate having hot feet. I hate having hot feet. So many a time you'll take your shoes off on day two of a training course, Jeff. Mm-hmm. Ken Schwab used to do that as well. I don't know if he still does, but he was a, sh- a shoes off kind of guy, wasn't he? Yeah, he was, yeah. Training with shoes on. I sometimes think, yeah, people might take offence to that smell, especially... Well, it is it is culturally offensive in some places. I couldn't tell you which countries, but I'm sure in some countries that is um, that is a bit of a no-no. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, kind of a... Anything else going on for you? Do you enjoy it today? Any... Reflection. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. I, I, I love the curiosity. Um, there was gen, gen, you know, genuine curiosity about not just what what could be done or what could be used, but also how it could be shaped and, and reshaped. And mm. you know, there were times when they were saying, "Oh, we could could we use this technique in this situation?" Yeah, you know, we'd say, "Oh, I hadn't really thought of that," but yeah, that absolutely would work. Uh, so and that's 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 for me a, a really good sign of people who aren't just taking things as they hear them you know they're not just taking whatever we say as gospel they're taking it and with the pinch of salt that it deserves if they can use it as as we're using it brilliant but maybe not maybe they've come up with something better or use it in a different scenario or change it um, and you know the more you can make something your own the more more powerful it is i think really yeah um I think as well, we noticed today that people tying together, there's quite a lot of tying together one or two different techniques, which is nice to see as well, that it's not just about one technique, especially with coach, we're doing some coaching stuff today, where people were thinking about how they would compile an actual coaching session and maybe tying two techniques into one or stepping from one technique to the other, mm. rather than just taking it in a very much a, a sequenced approach, but how could you actually combine some of these things? Yeah. Techniques are an interesting thing, sort of exercises. Um, I remember years ago when I was going through some of my uh, professional coach training, they were given quite a few coaching techniques that could be quite useful. And I think a lot of people were overly keen to put them into practice and sort of force them into a coaching session because they'd been taught them, they wanted to use them. But also it made, made the coach... And remember, these are trainee coaches, relatively new and inexperienced and perhaps not too confident in their skill set. Gave them a certain sense of safety to have a technique to fall back on, a bit of process and you know, step one, step two, step three. Um, rather than the, the scary unknown of what we sort of call dancing in the moment, you know, of just letting, uh, trusting the process uh, and letting the conversation evolve. Mm. Uh, and it's so often where on earth, as a coach where on earth is this going i have no idea whether where this is going and the, you know this put this person or this team is expecting something from me you know i'm here as a coach this is my profession um we could just be wasting their time um 
talking about something completely inane. And I don't think I've really got, I, I could probably count on the fingers of one hand, the times when that's actually, that fear has actually come to fruition. Mm. Almost always something valuable emerges from that, that what you might think of or feel like at the, at the time is, is chaos or unstructured, uh, unstructured conversation really. Um, mm. And that, that craving of, Oh, maybe I should dig out a technique and they are open up, a, open up a book or pull out a cart. Yeah. This, this technique here will save me. Trust the process. Mm. Something that I remember Lee Simpson said that trust in the process, Lee Simpson, one of the comedy or comedy store players that, he said to me during an interview I did for him with him for my book, he said, it's just, it's, I think he said it's either trust in the process or you just follow the process or the process is the process. It, it's, it's something they don't, on stage, they don't really even think about. There's, there's, there's no effort involved. There's no um, stress involved. That's a, lot, that's a lot to do with the safety of being amongst your peers and your kind of trusted performers on stage but that's also a belief and a, a, a reassurance in the flow of the process of just knowing that something will come to you something will come mm. to me something will come to me or you've got four other people in your troop that that um that also yes, want success but that, that is true <laughs> also in the sense of a coaching conversation mm -hmm. because you're not there alone and that the person you're coaching is there with the same intent and with the same focus, hopefully as you have. Yeah. It's definitely a partnership. Yeah. You're not alone, but it can feel it can, it can incorrectly feel quite lonely. I know a lot of scrum masters, a lot of coaches as well, who, who take on their shoulders, the pressure of, of a successful coaching intervention or coaching conversation. Um, and yeah, that, that I think, I think it's a dysfunction. It's a, it's a, it's a under, an understandable dysfunction. Mm. But the, the, having that conversation about you know, accountability and ownership, I think is uh, is an important. We, we spent quite a bit of time actually, more more time than normal on an advanced CSM talking about the idea of contracting. Yeah, and the idea of you know who's responsible for what. What can you expect from me? Where are my boundaries? And being quite explicit, if you're if you're changing stances from, for example, coach to mentor, or facilitator, or what have you, so that everybody knows what they can expect of one another. And it's something that that's it's just it's so commonplace and expected in the world of professional coaching that you don't really think about it. Mm. But in in agile coaching, that idea of contracting about what we expect from one another what we need from one another doesn't really happen i, th I also think that's partly because the, there's still a the coaching element of a scrum master's role or job description or whatever that might be objectives hmm. from a corporate point of view is still probably quite low down the agenda i think it's probably seen as a fraction a mere fraction of the the purpose of the role from in many organizations that I've spoken to, um, mm. that still see if they are hiring scrum masters, they see them as, as maybe 10, 15% coaches. If okay. they're, you know, but, um, I think only a few organizations would see them as a, as largely a coach. So would you, would you expect a scrum masters, performance to be judged on the uh delivery or the success of the team i think it's partly the team and part of the organization isn't it i think i'd certainly like to think a team has a has a say on the performance or the appraisal of a scrum master I'm not sure if it happens a lot but uh, or enough Hmm. Especially, I mean, that gets even more cloudy if, which is quite commonplace and it, it exemplified on our, on our course this week when a scrum master is, is working with more than one team. Yeah. 
you know, how do you how do you know how effective that scrum master is being? How, are you setting that person up for success in the role? And also, that was on that point is an interesting thing that um, one person uh, when we t- so a couple of people introduced themselves as people who were scrum mastering more than one team. Another um, course attendee also added in that almost like a an ambition mm. of theirs was to scrum master more than one team. And I thought that was an interesting, like a, like it was a, um, you know, is it something to strive for? Mm-hmm. Seeing a, a position of status where you were a scrum master for more than one team. I thought that was interesting. Um, I didn't necessarily at first hand get the get the feeling that it was a matter of status but i wasn't i suppose i wasn't really looking at it that closely um i know from just speaking from my perspective uh, where um i do like to focus and i do like to be part of, the, of a really strong focused dedicated team but i also really like seeing different things mm. and so for me there is a, a sort of attraction to being part of more than one team because mm. i'm less likely to get bored um, uh, and it's not, I wouldn't say that I would see myself if I was scrum master for more than one team as, as more senior or more qualified or more capable than someone who's just got one team. Mm. Uh, I think it would possibly play to play to some of my, maybe my weaknesses. I don't know, but certainly my preferences. Mm. No, I think you're right. There's, um, it's just the danger of being overloaded, I think. <clears throat> and trying to in my, my from my perspective of thinking that what works for one team will work for another and trying to make my life easier my manage my time more efficiently by trying to standardize how i scrum master three different teams whatever it might be yeah yeah it's not i think it's certainly a lot easier when those teams are are not new you know, when they're, yeah when they're a little bit more oh, experienced yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Hmm. so then i suppose that brings us on to well how what, what's needed for that to happen and you know, we had, there was a there was a question was it yesterday maybe about how to how to encourage members of the team to take on more self-organization yes how do you increase self-organization and how do you hmm. You can't tell someone to be self-organizing, but like you, I think you said at the time that there's it's not binary. Mm. There are degrees of self-organizing. It's probably a a iterative, incremental process in itself. Small small elements that you might notice. Mm. I think I, I'm probably a little bit guilty of because I've been part of and I've I've coached and I've been part of great teams that would do some very what I would call very brave and very um, they'd call, call each other out in terms of the accountability would be quite trans would be quite in your face that, Oh my okay. God, that's quite confrontational. Mm-hmm. But I think for a lot of teams, that's a, that's um, quite a step, especially in some of the retrospectives that I've been facilitating lately when the, the kind of, instinctive response from scrum masters when I was when we were talking about emotions just talking about talking about talking about talking about emotions okay in a retro and they said that's a step too far that's my, ooh, my team are nowhere near that right now and I think well, sometimes I get a little bit you know kind of pushed uh, pushed back by thinking really are we are we back there now the teams won't even talk about emotions but to be blunt with myself then a lot of teams don't talk about their emotions with each other Mm. and they're never going to get anywhere near any sense of accountability if they can't admit any weakness or any flaws or any need need to help you know they they don't need to need to know when there's a weakness that they can they can fill and they can help each other out Mm. yeah there's um you know we spent we spent quite a bit of time with scrum master teams and talking about I say two sides. So there may well be more more angles, but if you're keeping it really, really simple, the two sides 
of of making a change. So in this situation, if some someone in the team is is resisting this idea of self organization, usually there's there's some some concerns underpinning that. They're they're worried about some negative consequences. Mm. Now whether whether I believe those those beliefs are true or not, that person does. Yeah. And I I think first of all just recognizing the fear that's that's driving the resistance is is a good starting point. Uh, meeting them where they are, being able to empathize with with their perspective and seeing if you can help them reduce those concerns, tackle those concerns, mitigate those concerns. Uh, some of them might not be true when we work it through. Some of them might be, uh, and we can do something out about it pretty quickly. Some of them maybe we can't do anything about, and we should just acknowledge that this is you know, a, a hurdle that would need to be overcome. But then the second side of that is, is well, is there anything in it for this person to be self or part of a self-organizing team? Do they have anything to gain? Do they see that they have anything to gain? Uh, I remember in the, certainly in the early days of Scrum, people were worried about you know, their marketability. Mm. Uh, if I if I become a jack of all trades by expanding, broadening my skill set rather than focusing on becoming the most uh, experienced and, and qualified person in my functional craft, then I would not not get a promotion. I wouldn't be able to become a more highly paid contractor, and so on. Mm. Whereas the market has changed for that now, you're looking, you know, full stack employees uh, are, are much more in demand, right? Because they, they they increase the agility of a team, they increase the the uh, the the uh, resilience of the team. I remember, I think I thought about this at the time. I think this came up during the the course. This <clears> time, but there's, I remember at Nokia. I think when I just joined at Nokia, there was a big backlash to the. Um, management team rebranding and renaming everyone as engineers. Okay. They said, you're no longer a tester or you're no longer a developer. You're an engineer. Mm. And whilst that to me, that sounds like quite a sensible kind of, you know, equalizing of status and reducing status. But it, unfortunately it upset quite a lot of people because they felt that their ident- identity had been uh, wiped out mm. and their achievements and their specialisms and their talent and their interests had been ignored largely. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it, it, you've got to, you have got to be careful with things as very seemingly as, as innocuous as job titles. Yeah. And, and what it means, you know, there's a, there's a lot of history within mm. organizations um, and there's, there's an element of something being done to people as well. Yeah. Yeah. If that comes out of the, I've no idea whether that did come out of the blue, but, um, the more that something is done to somebody, the greater the resistance there will be regardless of, of, of how inherently that good, that change is for that, that individual or that group. Yeah simply because it compromises their autonomy. But that, that sense of identity, you know, they, they, that is a tribe that they've been part of for a long time. It's, it's a tribe they put a lot of value into. I'm talking tribe here in the sense of you know, uh, not, not the Spotify model as such, but um, tribe as in uh, our tribal identity yeah. groups that we're yeah. part of. <clears throat> yeah. Common interests and common skills. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky, tricky political game, really. And you know, people are, we're all, we're all funny, weird people with our own preferences and attachments and, and things. And if we believe something to be ours, we want to hold on to it simply because it's ours. Yeah. Unless it can be replaced or traded for something that we believe to be better. Uh, and if we can initiate that trade rather than have the trade initiated upon us, Mm. Uh, it's more likely to be acceptable. Mm. Oh. We're in, um, I believe, we're in week nine of lockdown. Is it really? So mm. I was thinking about this today because um, we are, and people are, are avid followers of the podcast will know this, that we are approaching our 100th episode. I know it's kind of a 
we talked about meaning, meaningless milestones before. Yes, yes. But, uh, numbers. <laughs> but the nervous 90s are almost upon us. So I kind of, we always said that um, we would do, start. I think even last Christmas you said to me, oh, we'll have to start thinking about what we're going to do for the 100th, you know, the 100th episode. True? And um, Big party. I just, all I'm, my fear is that we won't actually be in a pub for episode 100. So that would be, it, I reckon. It's a genuine, it's a, it could well happen. It could well happen, yeah. 10 weeks. I think, I think we'll have, we should have greater freedom in 10 weeks' time. Although one of my friends text uh, on, a, on one of my WhatsApp groups for rugby um, this today, this evening. A kind of a red alert message said uh, there's a, there's a beer garden open in uh, in Winsley at the pub in Winsley which is just down the road for me and I kind of thought is that allowed yet firstly is he telling the truth secondly if he is telling the truth surely that's not allowed yet it's but, a uh, trap black adder <laughs> but the amount of kind of response that a message like that got on WhatsApp because oh my god there's a beer garden open oh my god um, so, well, you have you have my commitment that we will do something special for episode one hundred. I think it'd be nice to gather some ideas, so perhaps people can tweet in with some suggestions about. Because what we do, what I don't want to go as much as I love Cheltenham, I don't want to go back to the first place we did episode one because that's a bit predictable and a bit. <sighs> yeah. So it'd be nice to do something a bit different. I, New York. I don't know. <laughs> yeah I wonder where it will be and what and um, different kind of pub maybe or a different kind of yeah. drink because it, it could well be in the middle of the summer or maybe the end of the summer we'll have to see what how time is go but it's certainly going to be in the next few months well I reckon it'll, it'll probably be close to my birthday ah okay and you still haven't had your launch party yet either that's true that's true. <laughs> so, um, yeah, maybe we can tie something together, a big bash. Hmm. When's this going to go out, do you think, next week? Yeah. So if you're listening to this, yeah, if you're listening to this on Wednesday, you should, you should try and put them out on Wednesdays now. Okay. Lockdown Wednesdays. So we'll have done our open space, which is this Friday. Yeah. So I would say I would advertise tickets, but people have probably already it's already probably already happened. Yes, that's why that's why I was asking. Yeah, maybe we maybe we cut that bit. <laughs> that didn't work, viewers, listeners. <laughs> oh, I did a I did a little video for our pubcast this week. Oh yeah, yeah 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 yeah, that was good. I, I, I like that. enjoyed watching. So, you give a look at the stats. It's quite staggering how much how much alcohol we've consumed in the and it's for over four years now, isn't it? We recently had our four year anniversary, hmm. which was something like early May, I think. It was. That's only a pint a week. <laughs> That's relatively sensible between us. Half a pint yeah. a week. Hmm. That's something else. It's definitely a sustainable pace. <laughs> No, so have a look at, see if you can um, search out our uh, our podcast cartoon video. Yeah, we had some we had some ideas for some some new features. Did we for our, for our listeners? Um, for, oh yes, for our patron listeners. Um, so we'll see what what feedback that gets. Whether there's anybody's interested in some of those things, being a guest on on the podcast, um, getting your questions personally answered each month, these kinds of things. Lock ins, have your own. Uh, patron only uh chat a little zoom call just for us so these kinds of ideas see what people think um okay all right well how you feel like yeah me too me too and it's uh oh it's hot yeah um, we had a barbecue tonight i think i might go out inside and enjoy the rest of the sunshine sounds like a good idea hmm all right, well, um, take care, mate. Yeah, send you, sir. And look after yourself, everybody. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. <laughs>